All right, hi everybody. My name is Gib Eggie. I am the instructor, an instructor here at College of DuPage. I'm also the coordinator of uh, experiential education. So we see uh, what we do as a delivery mode. So if you came here to the college to have a, a class in here, like this room, talking about anatomy and physiology, you can do things online, you can do asynchronous learning, you can uh, do independent study, but we do field study. So these are all four credit classes taught in the field. And we use the national parks for a lot of our, our field studies classes, as you'll soon see. So this is the delivery mode. A little about me. Those of you that wanted to see Lynn Dudzik, she'll be here later, OK? So if you came to meet Lynn, the behind the scenes person with us, um, you'll have to wait. She's, she's doing the encore tonight. Um, so anyway, these are, these are our classes. So as you can see, we visit quite a few national parks. Personally, I brought students to 60 of them. As the college, we've been to 62. There's one we still need to get to. I'll talk about that maybe a little bit later on. But like I said, it's a delivery mode. What are these students learning? Uh, we're in Yellowstone here. That could be learning geology. In this case, we are doing a snowshoeing program. Uh, Denali National Park. You might see some of your faces in here, guys. Um, this was dog sledding and snowshoeing in Denali. And the one up in here in Canyonlands I did with the veterans where we tried to get a bunch of College of Page recently discharged veterans back into the field, back reacquainted with the college lifestyle. We did that through a speech class. So believe it or not, those students up there are getting speech credit. Speech 1100 <laughs> with the veterans. So national parks. Um, our National Park Service manages over 400 different sites. These are national monuments, national battlefields, national historic places. Uh, national Historic Parks, but we're going to be talking about this specifically the 63 National Parks, and those are the ones highlighted here on the image. If you think about how much space it takes up, if you look at uh, Kansas right here, all the national parks we have could fit into there. So about 2% of our country is national parks. And again, that's just national parks. I'm not talking about national forests or BLM land or um, state parks. These are just the national parks, 2%. So let's start with the first one. Not the first one, the last one. <laughs> I do this different all the time. So just to make it a little more exciting, we're going to go kind of in an order. So we're going to start with the newest national park, um, the New, New River Gorge National Park and Preserve, which is in West Virginia. Uh, this recently became a national park, and we hit this place right after COVID. This was our first, like, we can finally travel again. But we can't fly. Where do we go? Oh, there's this new national park. Let's go there. So we went to the New River Gorge National Park and Preserve. What's different about this place is that this, what you see right here, um, eight of our national parks are national parks and preserves, meaning you can do extra things on the land you can in national parks, uh, mainly hunting. So this is one of the national parks, the only two in the lower 48 states that do allow hunting. Uh, we don't offer any hunting credit at College of New Page, um, but we do offer hiking classes, which we can do here. Um, we offer kayaking, whitewater, canoeing, kayaking, which you can do here. It's also a great place to explore American history. So this is the deepest canyon this side of the Mississippi River. The water in the New River comes all the way from the Carolinas, cuts through this canyon, and it exposed a lot of this coal, these coal seams, which have been uh, mined throughout the years and really helped our country develop. So I'll put it that way. So that's New River Gorge. And the next newest park, is in New Mexico. This is another one that was a national monument that recently got upgraded. And this is the White Sands National Park, the largest dip, gypsum sand, sand field in the world, 275 um, square miles of sand dunes, half of which is included in the White Sands National Park. Um, obviously, we like to hike here. We hike here, uh, but there are really no trails. You just kind of head out to the dune surface. There is, there's Paul, Paul's here somewhere. There's Paul. So there's Paul hiking through the uh, what looks like a um, what looks like a thunderstorm brewing, which there was. We had a ranger on our hike for this one, and she had this little what looked like a pager on her, which would alert her to thunderstorms. Obviously, Paul is the tallest thing in White Sands right now, <laughs> so we want to make sure that we keep Paul safe, which is always our number one priority on our field studies classes. And um, the north part of this gypsum sand dune is where the Trinity site was. So as this place was, uh, you know, national parks are a lot of times adjacent to these, these other areas that are owned by our government. So you can still see missile um, casings in White Sands National Park. 
But uh, an important thing happened here in 1945 when the first nuclear bomb was actually detonated. And three weeks later, uh, we dropped one on Japan. That's kind of dark. Uh, another new one closer to home. This is our, uh, our closest national park, Indiana Dunes National Park. It used to be a national lakeshore. There were four of them. Now there's only three. So they recently um, upgraded Indiana Dunes to a national park. This raises a little controversy. It's like, why are we moving it to a national park? It was just fine as a national lakeshore. So I'm not going to get into this too much, but it's one of our newer national parks. And it's actually pretty nice because it does preserve over 14, or 1,500 different species. You have the seashore, you have the dune fields, and you have the forests. So you see quite a bit of plants walking through the dune fields. But it is also adjacent to some industry. So, but I guess we take what we can get here in the, the suburbs. Next one is another one that even has a little more objection to becoming a national park. So be, become a national park, it's usually something with a lot of land, a lot of recreational opportunities are available, and there's usually something natural of some like aesthetic value. Think of like Yosemite, Yellowstone, Glacier, Hawaii volcanoes. But what about Gateway Arch National Park? So this one was recently upgraded from a national monument. Sure, it's very important. This is the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi River, where the Corps of Discovery departed, um, Lewis and Clark, to kind of discover this newly acquired land. Um, but does it have the acreage? Um, not so much, it's very urban. Um, obviously it does protect this arch, and it's, it's new. If you haven't been there recently since it's been a national park, it's very different. Uh, but it also does include another historic, which is the courthouse here. So if any, fam any of you familiar with Dred Scott, and what happened there, which led up to the Civil War. A lot of that stuff happened there at, uh, at the courthouse. Next park. This is Pinnacle's first time here. This picture was taken while it was a national monument. This was one that was upgraded recently from National Park to National Monument, or excuse me, National Monument to National Park. Pardon me, I've got two slideshows going here. Uh, this is kind of like a shoots and ladders park, where the trails are very interesting because they go up and down this extinct volcano and you use these arm, arm rails and iron paths to kind of crawl around. There's 13 different species of bat that live in pinnacles. So if you get down into the talus fields and explore the caves down below, um, you might see some of those bats. Um, so the trails actually go through these talus fields as well. So if you're into to bats, we actually have a bat field study coming up. It doesn't go to pinnacles, but you'll still um, get a much better education on bats than I would here. So. Um, but the main thing that's uh, of interest in pinnacles is the California condor. Um, these were nearly extinct. We, they removed 20, 20 remaining California condors from the wilderness to try to bring the species back. Um, a lot of things affected them. Um, obviously development of their habitat, DDT. But the main thing was lead, lead poisoning. So look at this guy, he's bald, meaning that he, he likes to eat carrion, so things that are shot. They'll go down and kind of scavenge through and eat them. So what happens a lot of times, the hunters will shoot things, the thing will run away, they'll never find it. The condors will find it. And they'll go in there and they'll start eating at them and they'll get lead poisoning and they'll eventually die. So um, there's been a lot of efforts to bring them back and Pinnacles is one of the places where they release them into the wild. So if this is something you want to see, um, it's pretty incredible. These things can be 25 pounds, wingspan of almost 10 feet. So if you ever get a chance to to go to the Bay Area, definitely make a trip down to, uh, to Pinnacles to check these guys out. Great Sand Dunes, this is another park and preserve. This is that other one that's in the lower 48 states, so you, you are allowed to hunt here. This is the, the tallest dunes in North America. So these dunes are 750 feet tall. This is a great place to teach Leave No Trace hiking. So we always try to teach Leave No Trace when we do our, our outdoor trips, just to kind of protect the parks, make them more uh, better than we found them, not at least as good as when we found them. So all these durable surfaces everywhere. So when we hike all over and climb the Star Dune, which is the highest point in Great Sand Dunes, the next day it's like an Etch-a-Sketch. The whole trail is just shaken and all the footprints disappear. So that's what I like about Great Sand Dunes. It also protects uh, old growth forests and peaks up to 13,000 feet. So a lot of people don't venture into those areas, but those are there as well. All right, uh, this one is in the southeast in South Dakota. This is Congaree. What's notable about this park is that it has a lot of champion trees, meaning the biggest of their species in the world. 
All right, so I believe there are 15 species of champion trees in, in uh, Congre. You can see it's a it's kind of a swampy area, so uh, trails are fairly easy, very accessible. Obviously, if you put a trail through Congre that didn't have a boardwalk, it'd just be a slushy, muddy mess. But they were uh, they were kind enough to build these boardwalks for us to really kind of get in the middle of these trees and really experience them. Well, elephant, but also entomology. So if you're into bugs, um, Congre is notable for their mosquito meter. So we went on a not too bad day here, but the the, the mosquitoes can get quite aggressive in this national park. So if you're a fan of mosquitoes, this is a good spot. And who isn't, right? You can't go to a or national park without. Prepare. And that's plan ahead and prepare, so make sure you bring mosquito repellent when you go to, to Congre. Uh, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. This one's not too far. This is in uh, Cleveland, of all places. Cleveland has a national park. Uh, yeah, I had Ken Potenberg's here. Ken's in the front. Ken's wearing the red jacket. Ken has done how many trips with CID, Ken? How many? How many classes have you been on with us? 78. 78. <laughs> so Ken is kind of the Waldo in these slides. <laughs> so Ken's right here. You're going to see Ken a lot. I, I kind of put him in here for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, back to this national park. This is in Cleveland. This is a more of an urban national park, which is kind of neat because it does preserve kind of the historic Ohio and Erie Canal, where you can bike along this Ohio Canal, which went all the way from the Ohio River to Cleveland, which is now a towpath trail. So think of barges being dragged up and down here by livestock, you can now bicycle them. Bicycle them. Um, and the, the thing I like about it is once you get to the end, they have a railroad which will take your bike, put you back on the train, and bring you back where you started. So instead of having a 70 mile ride, you have a 35 mile ride and a 35 mile scenic train ride uh, back to the trailhead. Also notable waterfalls yeah. within the park if that's your thing. Black Canyon of the Gunnison, this is, if you think of the Grand Canyon as wide and deep, the, the Black Canyon is very narrow. So this is in Colorado. This is some of the oldest exposed rock in the world. There's rock here that's 1.8 billion years old. So obviously a wonderful uh, geology classroom. And you can also see some of these seams. This is called, I think, painted, the painted wall, where you can see these seams where um, younger rock is kind of filled in all of the gaps there um, throughout time. So something we like to do here obviously is hiking, but it's also a, a notable place to do rock climbing. So this is a, a couple of people climbing the painted wall and you can see the little pieces of rock protection they have within that crack as they make their way up to camp before, um, before the sun sets. That's the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. They call it Black Canyon, anybody know why? There's parts of that canyon where the sun never hits. So it's so deep and so narrow that sun rays do not hit the bottom of black, parts of Black Canyon of the Gunnison. This is Death Valley. This is the, I've been here since 1994, so this is the first national park since I started working here. I always remember that. So this is in uh, California, a little bit of it in Nevada. Uh, protects a lot of inhospitable areas. So this is a place called Badwater Basin, which is 282 feet below sea level. It's the deepest point in the United States, in all of North America. Um, it's also the driest point. There's years where it doesn't rain at all here. It's also the hottest. So over 130 degree temperatures have been recorded at this part of Death Valley. It's also a shooting location for, anybody seen the original Star Wars movie? So we've got a couple hikers going down here. So they shot the movie Star Wars here. Um, you can still hike through the slot canyons. Um, they have no, more sand dunes. Our park loves sand dunes. Very pretty. So this is the Mesquite sand dunes. You can experience that. But one of the more notable places we like to visit here um, is this mysterious place called the Racetrack Playa. Yeah, very difficult to get here. You need a high clearance four-wheel drive vehicle. Um, I was able to convince a couple people to drive out here with the groups. Some of you have probably been to the racetrack with me. There's always a mystery how this happens. So you go out here and there's these rocks in the middle of the playa that have these giant trails. It's almost like a giant came and just dragged them across the backcountry. And for a long time, they really didn't know what it was. Um, the, the belief was that it rains a lot, it gets slippery, wind comes through, and it just blows this thing a little bit. You know, years pass, the same thing happens, blows it a little bit. Uh, but the scientists actually came out here and put GPS receivers on the rocks. 
And what they found was what you need is it to rain. You need enough rain to collect. And then you need the top of the water to freeze at just about a level of the middle of the rocks. So we're talking very ideal conditions. And then you need wind. So when this the ice starts to melt, the wind will blow these ice encrusted rocks across and create these little tiny trails. So this is something that was just recently discovered. So that's the racetrack in Death Valley. Uh, now we have Joshua Tree, another California park. This protects two deserts, the Mojave and the Colorado Desert. Joshua trees are found in the Mojave Desert, which is a little bit higher. Get their name from the biblical figure Joshua, who the Mormons believe was well, using his hands to welcome people to the West. So that's how Joshua trees got their name. A little lower in elevation, you'll find the Colorado Desert. Different sets of plants. These are uh, jumping choya cactus. So as you can see from here, uh, these guys become um, disjointed very easily, just rubbing against the little hooked pins. will collect on you, and they do not want to come off. The more you fight them, the more they get stuck to you. So good thing we had a leather glove and some pliers to remove that, uh, that cactus spine. Also has the only uh, native um, palm in California, the California fan palm, and this is where you find wildlife. So if you want to find wildlife in Joshua Tree National Park, you go to where the water is, and that's where these palm, fan palms are. Also, incredible geology, talk about wind, erosion, uh, carving these areas. This is a place called Skull Rock. That's my daughter bouldering over there. And then we also have these beautiful arches that were carved um, throughout time by the wind. Just little bits of sand scraping across the really rough granite throughout time. Saguaro. Uh, this one is in Tucson. So this is a kind of an urban park. It flanks both sides of Tucson, Arizona. These are saguaro cactuses. These can live to be 150 years old and they grow their first arm at about 75 or 100 years. And they can get to be about 40 feet tall. So we'll see quite a bit of these large fields of them when you go out to saguaro. Also have barrel cactus there, prickly pear cactus, those jumping choya cactus. So if you're a cactus fan, I put that one on your list. Also a place to check out uh, Native American pictographs. Or excuse me, these are petroglyphs. Petroglyphs are chipped into the rock, which these guys are. Uh, petroglyphs are painted on the rock. So this is in um, Saguaro. The next one, 1992, so we're getting, uh, we're getting into the 90s. Early 90s, this is Dry Tortugas. If you don't know where this is, you start in Miami, you head to Key West, and then you get on a boat, and you travel five hours west and through the Florida Straits, and you'll come upon this national park. Named Dry Tortugas by Ponce de Leon uh, because it was dry, didn't have any fresh water, and there were tortugas. Spanish speakers? Turtles. There's a lot of turtles in this area. So what we like to do here is this wall that's created by this fort called Fort Jefferson. There's all coral reefs along the side of this. So you jump in the beach and you can snorkel around very shallow and explore all sorts of different corals. And if you're lucky, uh, turtles as well. Um, another notable thing about this area is it was where John Wilkes Booth was sent after he tried to assassinate, or I'm sorry, not John Wilkes Booth, the doctor that set John Wilkes Booth's leg was sent here after he, um, after he did that during the Civil War. And also the rangers usually don't point this out, but you see a lot of boats from Cuban refugees. So it's kind of where a lot of Cubans enter the country um, and um, eventually I imagine become American citizens due to the refugee status. So that's in Dry Tortugas. Uh, Utah we have, or excuse me, Nevada, we have the Great Basin National Park. Um, a lot of our parks are incredible because they have dark skies. We do not have dark skies here in the Midwest, or not like uh, like you're used to out here. So we live under what's called a Bortle 7 sky, I meaning you can see some stars, but can you see the Milky Way here? No way. These are Bortle 1 skies. So these are skies, much like they looked hundreds of years ago, are still visible in places like um, Great Basin, because there's really not too much development here. Um, originally protected to protect this cave, called the Lehman Cave. It was a national monument in the 1920s. Um, and then later on, in the 1986, I believe, they absorbed more of the area to create the national park. But one thing that people really like to see here are the bristlecone pines. So you have to climb up into the high country here 
Um, just about 10,000 feet, and you'll see these bristlecone pines. These are the oldest living things in the world. Okay, there was a tree uh, studied up here that was over 5,000 years old. So we'll talk about tall trees, old trees, and um, big trees. These are the old ones, or the bristlecone pines, which are found in the Great Basin. Okay, now we're going to get to some of the Alaska parks. The reason the Alaska parks are bulked together is because in the 1980s they created um, seven of the eight Alaska national parks. Um, it has a lot to do with statehood, it has a lot to do with Alaska Natives uh, settlement on their land, and you can, you can look at it, it's called the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, but this big act and put, set aside a, a various acres of land to later be developed for public spaces, and that's what created these national parks. <clears throat> Excuse me, the first one is Glacier Bay. Anybody been on a cruise before that went up Glacier Bay? Yeah. Uh, it's fairly popular. If you ever do an inside passage cruise to Alaska, there's a good chance you'll go up to Glacier Bay and see the Margie, Margarine Glacier, which is right here. It's 21 miles long, it goes up to 10,000 feet. And it comes down to sea level here, and you can see these icebergs calve off. At one point, uh, when George Vancouver discovered this area, it was 62 miles further down the fjord. So it's moved 62 miles up since then. Uh, what we like to do here is sea kayaking. So this is a great place to explore by sea kayak. So our kayaker is prepared. She's got, well, we usually wear dry suits when we're in these areas because you do not want, not want to fall into Glacier Bay. A good chance of seeing sea otters. Um, sea lions, seals, orcas, and uh, humpback whales. What I like about Glacier Bay, this is something that's recent. We were here last year. Um, there's always been issues in Alaska with people that are, the people that Alaska attracts are kind of your frontiers people. They don't like to be told what to do. They, um, they like their freedom. So, um, and that can be said about the Alaska Natives too. So when the Alaska National Parks came in and said, okay, we're going to allocate these lands for federal purposes. This is public land now. This is no longer yours. There was a lot of um, um, trouble, including with the Alaska Natives. So recently, uh, Glacier Bay National Park is once again welcoming the Clinket, which are the, I think of totem poles in these paintings. That's kind of typical of their craft. But they're being welcomed back into the National Park again to, to go about their business, go about their hunting and gathering, which they weren't when the National Park was established. So that was, that was welcome back. So um, this is something they just put up with, a, it's a peace pole. So what the, um, if you can read a totem pole, they go from the bottom to the top. So this kind of talks about their story with how they used to hunt and gather fish and eggs. And then here's the glacier here. And here they are having a great time. You know, you see icebergs in the water and they're drying their fish. Uh, there's their lodge house and then the park came in. So they, they saw the, the park service as this eyeless person with all of these hands to just grab as much as they can. So this is how the, the Clinket <laughs> Indians saw the, the government. And then they saw rough seas. So you can't see this guy, but he's got tears, and he has tears. So this is the rough seas. And then in the 90s, the, the scroll is kind of a proclamation that the park service made saying, yes, we want you to come back on your, your ancestral lands, and you can go about um, doing the things you once did before. And it kind of culminates at that um, house at the top. So this lodge you see right here where now they have their their uh, gatherings and meetings. So uh, I think moving in the right direction that way with um, the Alaska Natives. Um, going from Alaska Natives, going to some of our old homesteaders. Alaska was the last place you could homestead. Um, one place we go check out when we're at Lake Clark, which is another park in Alaska, is the homestead of Dick Prennicky. So do yourself a favor and uh, read a one man's wilderness or there's a PBS special about this guy that uh, homesteaded in Alaska from the 50s to the, the late 90s. He built this cabin all by himself and pretty much lived off the land for 30 years all by himself. So you can experience this place in Lake Clark. Also a great place to see black bears. So, uh, <laughs> this guy was plenty far away. This is a telephoto lens. Um, oh, and also we like to um, get in a kayak here in Lake Clark. This is taken at one o'clock in the morning. It doesn't get dark in Alaska in the middle of summer. Another Alaska park, Katmai was the site of the biggest uh, natural disaster of the 20th century when a volcano erupted and discharged over 30 times the quantity of Mount St. Helens discharged, creating this giant ash field that you see right here. 
Um, but people don't come here so much to see uh, the ash field and the volcanoes, they come to see the bears. Um, what attracts the bears to Katmai? Salmon. So every summer, um, thousands of salmon come. The salmon story is amazing as well, I'm not going to go into it, but um, these guys will be born, they'll go out to the ocean for a bunch of years and come back to the very same place they were born to have their, their young and then they'll die off. So what attracts salmon are those bears that you saw in that photograph here. Only way to get there is by bush plane. And you just think of all these salmon, just the stories they have to tell, and only to end oh, being just swiped by a uh, brown bear. So this is a brown bear. Um, a lot of people say they're grizzly bears, but they're not. Brown bears are much bigger. So brown bears live near the coast. They eat a lot, a lot of protein from these fish, so they're going to be bigger than grizzly bears. So this is a brown bear in Catlin. We do have a guardrail between uh, the photographer here and the bears as well. But they kind of co-mingle with people in this area. They'll be using the same trails as you. So if you're a bear fan, it's a great place to go. Uh, next Alaska Park is the Kenai Fjords. This is more of an aquatic park best explored by kayak, boat. There are a few trails, but I usually come here to jump on a boat and explore and learn about um, the wildlife. Also quite a bit of glaciers. You can see orcas here. Um, you can see humpbacks. You can kayak with them. <laughs> uh, humpbacks are kind of interesting because they're just massive animals, but they eat this very, very, very tiny, fine um, aquatic animal. And they eat it through filters, so they'll take a big mouthful of these guys and then plunge it all the water out through and just lick their, um, what, what's it called, baleen, to lick all these microscopic guys off. So we're never worried about being you know, attacked by humpbacks, but you do have to be aware of, they can make these spontaneous breaches when you're in a sea kayak. Also puffins, a lot of, a lot of puffins here. There's horned puffins, and, horned puffins and tufted puffins. These are the horns you can see coming out of his eyes. Um, you know they're puffins because they flap their wings like hummingbirds over 300 times a minute. And they will lay one egg. So the male and female usually stick together. They'll come to shore, they'll lay one egg. When the baby's born, it'll make sure the weather looks okay and it's dark, there's nothing around, then it'll leave. It'll go into the water and it won't come back for three years. So it spends most of its time out in the rough seas. I think this is our last Alaska park, uh, Wrangell St. Elias. This is the biggest national park we have. It's right on the border of Canada, it protects the Wrangell Mountains, the St. Elias Range. Great place to look at glaciers. You can see the moraines that are carved by these glaciers. Um, this was taken from an airplane because really the only way you can access a lot of this park is by plane. You can drive, but when you rent a car in Alaska, they say you can't drive on this road. You have to sign something and say, okay, I won't drive on this road. And that can be said about a lot of the roads in Alaska. Also protects the Kennecott copper mine. So again, we're talking about early American history and this, uh, very photogenic copper mine that's really in the middle of nowhere, which makes you wonder about the people that built these places. And, and the first people that actually discovered copper in this area that even in the 21st century, we need to take multiple planes just to get here. You can still wander around the copper mine. You can see porcupines. Um, these guys are completely fearless. Um, they're not scared of you at all for good reason. And I always recommend getting the window seat. This is also the National Park, but this is taken on a flight back from Chicago. Again, this is one of those overnight flights where you can still see the, the sun. And what's notable about this, this is the largest, one of the largest glaciers in the world. This is called the Malaspina Glacier, which is a Piedmont glacier, and it's about 1,400 or 1,500 square miles. So it's massive, really huge, which is about 10, per, 10 times larger than our next park, uh, Biscayne. This is in Florida, that's Miami right there. Biscayne is primarily a water national park. So when we come here, we might be studying uh, fishes or mangroves or manatees, but you can also, it looks like a park. You know, those are all boaters in from Miami going to Biscayne, just kind of going for the day, taking the boat for a ride. So again, parks are really accessible for all sorts of different reasons to all sorts of different people. But again, to really explore it, you need to hit the water, explore the mangroves, and see the manatees and dolphins, etc. Other ocean is the Channel Islands. These are right off the coast of California. There are eight Channel Islands, five of which are national parks. So really the only way to get here is by boat. It's a very beautiful place. This is called the Galapagos of North America just because of the wide array 
of animals. Many are endemic to the islands. So you can't see these animals anywhere else. Get on a boat, get on a smaller boat, and then you have a lot of times these islands literally to yourself. It's amazing to think how close we are to Los Angeles when we get up to Channel Islands. Uh, next one is the Badlands, South Dakota. Has anybody gone here on a driving trip for summer vacation with your parents? <laughs> then you do, um, you got to do the Wall of Drug and the Corn Palace and the <laughs> Mount Rushmore. So this is a great for paleontology. There's a lot of uh, fossils in this park. Also, a great place to explore wildlife. These are uh, bighorn sheep. These guys have horns, not antlers. So this is a um, this is a bachelor group. So the, the women tend to hang out together and the men kind of hang out together. Uh, these are men and they have uh, these uh, horns on their head. And you can tell how old one of these sheep are because they create a full curl at about eight years old. So, and the alpha guys are kind of the big ones back in the middle. They kind of call the shots and the younger ones are more on the, on the outsk outskirts. But a notable animal here, and you can't really talk about national parks without talking about bison. So bison are one of the parks where you can see bison. There are uh, quite a few bison, 30 million bison roam the Great Plains. But by the late 1880s, 325 of them were left. So they were hunted near extinction. So um, thanks to these places like national parks where you could bring animals where they couldn't be hunted, their numbers have now rebounded quite a bit. So there are now 1,200 animals in this park uh, because of a group of I would say 50 were brought in from the adjacent park to the north, which is the Theodore Roosevelt National Park, which also has bison. Uh, this park is very much like Badlands. It does have Badlands. It has some um, petrified wood, quite a bit of wildlife, but it also um, showcases President Theodore Roosevelt. So this is his cabin right there. You know, he was kind of legit. He was from New York. He was very uh, white collared, but he had a he was a naturalist. He was self taught. He would. He would shoot animals and he would taxidermy them in his basement when he was a little kid. He was really into um, being a cowboy, so he came out west, he wanted to be a cowboy, so he discovered this area, he built this cabin. Next year, 1884, his wife and his mom die on the same day. So he's like, oh, how did he grieve? He came back out to this area and he built another park, or excuse me, another uh, cabin. Area. So Theodore Roosevelt really loved this place and he's one of our most um, conservative presidents. He was a conservation president. You think of a lot of public lands were protected because of them. So you can see prairie dogs here. These are called the fast food of the, the tundra or the, the prairie. Lots of animals eat these guys. They're an easy, quick meal. And the, the hikers kind of look like prairie dogs. Uh, <laughs> this is also a place where you can see wild horses. So back in the day, you're talking the frontiers, they would just let horses run wild. And as soon as you needed a horse for some reason, you would just go out prairie, you rope one down, you'd break it, and you have yourself a horse. So when the park was established, they created a fence around Teddy Roosevelt, but they couldn't rope up all the horses. So uh, still, I think 200 of them live in the park and they just pretty much are going with the flow. Now it's a part of it. So if you're into wild horses and you want to see them in the wild, um, that's a great park to visit. Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Voyagers, this is up in Minnesota. This is along the border of Minnesota and Ontario. It protects the, um, the waterways that the voyagers, the fur trappers, would travel on their way into interior Canada for, uh, for fur, for fur pelts. So we like to see kayak here. Um, so this is voyagers. It's also near a place called Boundary Waters. You might have heard of Boundary Waters. So these, great, these places are great for paddling, for canoeing, sea kayaking. Uh, but we also like to do dog sledding up here. So I have a veteran of this trip here. Uh, so we dog sled up here. So those lakes that you would sea kayak and canoe on in the summer, you dog sled on them in the summer in the winter time. So these are dogs that are come from Greenland. They were uh, the dogs are owned by a guy named Paul Shirky, who was the first person to go to the North Pole unassisted. So he's the first person to do this back in the 80s. So he owns a whole bunch of dogs dogs up in Minnesota now, and he got these dogs from Greenland, and they're the descendants of the best dogs he could find. So in the winter time, he lets, he lets us bring their dogs into the back country where we will do dog sledding in, uh, in Voyagers. So that's where we camp on lakes. Um, that little pick right there is how we get water. It's a giant steel pole that we punch through the lake to get water. Otherwise, it freezes really solid. 
Um, we had a couple rough nights on this trip. I think 40 below zero. You can sh we have a proof right here. It was, um, it was an all female group. And I think some of them, most of them never camped before. So they spent their very first night outside um, at 40 below zero in the middle of this wild place. Uh, but we did stay warm and we did that by cutting down trees. You know, normally when we have campfires on camping trips, we only burn dead firewood that's on the ground. You can break by hand, but when it's 40 below zero, it's very different. And you can't find the wood. There's so much snow. So what we do instead is we, we cut down um, dead trees. So we cut down dead trees and we're burning literally logs all night long um, just to stay warm. So um, not the best environmental practice, but it's more of a, a survival tactic when you're up here um, camping in, in the Northwoods. Uh, next one is arches. I don't know if you've probably been here, this is a very famous park in Utah. Um, you're looking at just a specific moment in geological time where there's over, I think, 2,000 natural arches in Arches National Park. So coming a million years, that arch will probably be gone. You know, a million years earlier, it probably didn't look like that. So you're catching arches really at a good time. So obviously a good place to, to explore geology and how wind, water, and erosion shape, shape the world. So that's the same photograph. I took this one, I just moved my camera over. This one I had to Photoshop out a few people, but you can see these places are incredibly busy, especially arches, which makes me um, really hit home planning ahead and preparing when you go to one of these places. Um, unknowing to myself, I was here during a Mormon holiday when the kids didn't have school. You know, they had school here, but they didn't in Utah. Um, and also in arches now, you need to make reservations to get inside the park, imagine that. So, but it's still, this is a very accessible landmark. It's about a three mile uh, hike to see the delicate arch, which is on potion stamps, license plates, and kind of the symbol of, uh, of the park, even though it wasn't included in the original National Park, uh, but now it is. Uh, this is landscape arch, another arch in arches. Uh, this is the, I think the fifth longest span arch in the world. And also you can see arches within arches. And then Ken, there's Ken again. <laughs> So Ken was on, like, Ken, I'm gonna get up at four o'clock in the morning to get this photograph. It's like, awesome. So we got up early this day to, so this is turret arch and the windows in Arches National Park, so quite a few. Uh, this is the North Cascade, and there's Ken at the bottom left again. Uh, this is in Northern Washington, so really only snow free a uh, few months out of the year. So we tend to go to this area in August when the wildflowers all blo blooming and the trails are a little more accessible. If you're into fungus, this is a great place to explore funguses, given the damp nature. Uh, these are, uh, let me see. Uh, these are panther mushrooms, highly poisonous. Make sure you watch your animals, your dogs. These have been known to kill a lot of animals in the Pacific Northwest that forage for mushrooms. So just mushrooms in general, if you don't know what you're eating, don't eat it. Um, also, as you can see, still lots of snow, even in August where the trails were, were marked with uh, with flags. So another leave no trace trail because they're not going to see our footprints when that all melts. Uh, you'll see marmots here. Uh, these lazy guys uh, hibernate for about 200 days a year and these are the biggest members of the squirrel family. So if we, you got any marmot fans or uh, people into large squirrels, it's another great place to visit. California we have the Redwood Nat National and State Parks. This one is a little unique as well only because it's our only national park that's co-managed with a state park. So this is north of uh, San Francisco. These are your tallest trees. Okay, so we did the bristle cones, which are the oldest. These are the tallest. Um, 380 feet tall is that one on the left. Not the one in the middle. The one on the middle is kind of an average one uh, for scale, but the one on the right is called Hyperion, where years ago the ranger would tell you where it was, and he'd give you a little pass where you could go in and look at it. And now you can't, they don't tell you where it is. It's, you can find out online, uh, but they also have the area closed now where you can't access the Hyperion tree anymore. But still, if you want to see uh, large, tall trees near the coast, yes, the coastal redwoods. Also a great place to see elk. Um, elk are different than those bighorn sheep where elk shed their antlers. So if you hear antlers, that means they're shedded every year. Like this guy will shed those, whereas antlers will stay. Guadalupe Mountains, this is in Texas. This protects the Chihuahuan Desert. It is also the location, the highest point in Texas. 
it's one of those national parks not many people go through because they're not too familiar with it. Uh, but something interesting about this park, and a lot of them, are the Mather plaques. This is Stephen Mather. He was one of the first, this first superintendent of the national parks. He got inspired on trips to Europe when he would visit like the Swiss Alps and see how accessible these places were to all the people in France. Like, oh, you know, they've got all different trail levels and different ways to get here and there. So that was the inspiration for um, the national parks. He came back and kind of used that vision to increase accessibility into our current public lands. And these Mather plaques you can see in most national parks. So I always give these to my kids as like a little poor man's junior ranger program. Like find the Mather plaque and we'll get you ice creams and, and they'll always try to find them out. So this one's in Guadalupe. So next time you're in a park, um, check, the, check these out and kind of learn about this guy. Interesting. And always check your boots when you take them off because these guys sometimes go inside. This is a tarantula. Uh, you'll find those in Guadalupe Mountains as well as some, again, people lived in these national parks. Uh, when this became a national park, um, they didn't tear his house down, so you can still kind of visit these, um, these old pioneers cut style houses, including this one in Guadalupe. All right, we're getting there. We're getting to the good ones now. <laughs> Not that the other ones aren't good. Um, Canyonlands in Utah, great place for leave no trace, and as far as out, and also outdoor living skills, um, I love to do backpacking classes here because you really kind of have to uh, practice what you preach. This is our water source in, Can in Canyonlands. There's no rivers here, it's a dry desert. So you gotta talk to the ranger, you gotta figure out where the water sources are before you head out. And then we'll spend probably an hour filling everybody's water bottles and getting everybody hydrated. Um, so we'll put these through filters, get rid of all the dirty sediment. So it's a really laborious process, but um, very important to stay hydrated in the backcountry. There's Ken again. We'll also use uh, different means of going to the bathroom. So um, a lot of these areas you need to pack in everything. So uh, she, you can see here she's got her nice orange shovel here which she uses to dig a hole. And she also has one of these totally leave no trace toilets where you can really pack everything up. So we always encourage the best environmental practices on all of our trips. Uh, this is also in Canyonlands. This is that veterans group. We are in a slot canyon. Uh, if any of you have uh, seen the movie 127 Hours or read the book Between a Rock and a Hard Place about the guy that dislodged a rock in his hand and was stuck in a canyon in Canyonlands for five days, ended up having to break his arm off. No. Uh, he was trying to get to this rock, pan rock panel on the back there called the Great Gallery. So as you can see, we planned ahead and prepared we told everybody where we were going, we camped as a group, or we traveled as a group, all things you should do to kind of reduce the chances of getting stuck by yourself in an area. So this is a notable rock panel um, by the Ancestral Pueblo and people you can find in Canyonlands. And those figures in the back there, I'm talking about that rock, not these guys, they're, uh, they're life size. It's a very beautiful rock panel. So if you're ever out in Canyonlands and you want to study um, maybe ancient art, we have a group going to this area um, in our history class over to the, the national parks out here to study these very things. Petrified forest, very different than the forest you're, you're used to. This is all petrified logs, so we're talking um, 225 million year old logs that have been petrified through time and a large collection of these logs. Also were used for building structures, so again if you want to study architecture of some of our um, native Native Americans, you can see that here in Petrified Forest. This is a, a dwelling that they built out of the petrified logs. You can also see sand dunes, so a little bit like Badlands. This is a place called Blue Mesa in the National Park. And there's also the Painted Desert. So this stretches all the way from uh, Petrified Forest all the way to Grand Canyon. You can see the Petrified Desert. This is one of the, the better places to check that out. So very iron rich um, materials here. Plan ahead and prepare again. We're talking about Haleakala National Park. This photograph is taken at sunrise. This is um, supposedly the best place in the world to watch the sunrise, which I, I would say it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's the best, but it's, it's really great. Uh, but you need to reserve sunrise now. Before you could drive up to Haleakala and watch this majestic sunrise where all the clouds kind of fill the volcano, air, volcanic area, the sun comes up, it's really pretty, just like this. 
Uh, but now if you go, uh, not only do you have to get up at three in the morning for the drive up, it's the shortest road between um, sea level and 10,000 feet. So it's a long morning drive up to see the, um, see the sunrise here, but make sure you uh, reserve your sunrise. And you can also see uh, incredible volcanic landscape. So obviously volcanoes, great thing to study here. Uh, that's the big island of Hawaii on the horizon. You can see the two peaks that make, make up the big island. They also have telescopes up on the top here, very thin, thinner air, not a lot of atmosphere, very dry, makes it excellent for, um, for astronomy. Um, also plants, so there's more endangered plants in this national park than any other national park. The one on the left is not endangered, it's invasive, that's bamboo, so you can walk through these beautiful bamboo forests, but you can also see silver sword. These only grow up in the high country of Haleakala. So these are one of those plants that have a very beautiful flower and then they just die. So they're called silver swords. Um, also, you know, you're in Hawaii, so there's great waterfalls. And this is a park that goes all the way from 10,000 feet to sea level. So you see quite a bit of topography as you make your way across. This is Virgin Islands National Park. This is one that was, uh, you'll hear a lot about the Rockefellers when it comes to national parks. So there's St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix make up the Virgin Islands. This is the majority of St. John was set aside by a national park because it was land acquired through the Rockefellers. It was then donated to the government to be made into a national park. Um, so you can, you can enjoy these areas as, as much as anybody else. Uh, what's notable about here is the only place I know that has an underwater snorkeling trail. So you might have seen interpretive trails where you learn about plants and animals as you make your way around. Um, this is one where you don your mask and snorkel and you go underwater and you can learn about all sorts of fishes. So this is a um, cowfish, a honeycomb cowfish. You might see these guys. Um, and also you might learn about some early um, European settlements. So that's an old sugar plantation. This is a Taino pictograph from the people that lived here well before the, um, the Europeans came. This is one in Texas, Big Ben, and makes the big, you know, think of the Big Ben in Texas at the Rio Grande River makes, that's all in this park. So this is the only park that has its own mountain range within the park. We are up right now in that mountain range looking down to the desert. So this is kind of, I'd say three parks in one because you get mountains, you get ponderosa pine forests, you get lowland deserts, and you also have the river, the Colorado River that flows right through here. Mexico on one side and the United States on the other side. So you'll be hiking some of these trails and you'll note little trinkets so the people from Mexico will sneak over at night and they'll make these things and they'll put it out and they'll um, put little jars and you put money in there. This was right after 9-11 when they, they closed the border. There's a little town called Boquillas del Carmen right across the border that really relies on, on the people that visit the National Park to visit. But when 9-11 happened, you could not cross any illegitimate border in, in between uh, the states and Mexico anymore. So these people were really struggling. So this is one of the things they did. Now you can go there through an, uh, an official entry point, but you, you're in an iPad and you talk to somebody in El Paso and you clear customs and Rio Grande. Very different, uh, but an enlightening cultural experience just to go down to Mexico for a day. Mammoth Cave, this one's not too far. This is in Kentucky. We have a group going here in a couple weeks. Longest cave system in the world. Over 400 miles of passageways have been discovered in Mammoth Cave. Gets its name because it's big. Um, it's not the prettiest cave, but it is massive. Obviously, 400 <coughs> miles of pass. you got to think, that's about how long it is from here to Mammoth Cave if you were to drive. So all of that has been discovered. Um, big rooms, usually like this, also smaller rooms. And this is also another place where um, a lot of early Americans came. This guy came because, actually, the first guy that bought the land was a doctor who had tuberculosis. And he's like, okay, I think maybe if I bring people down here into this dark, you know, damp area, it, it may help them. So he, he put a lot of money into doing this, and yeah, they thought it worked, but in the long run, um, it didn't. But you still see marks from some of the early pioneers that came through here that would use um, soot to kind of write their name. Everybody wants to leave their mark. Isle Royal, this is all of an island in Lake, Mi or Lake Superior. So if you think of Lake Superior, I always think it looks like a wolf, and this is the Eye of the Wolf, about 40 miles wide. Uh, one of the more remote national parks we have, even though it's not too far from home, obviously a remote because you need to put some effort into getting there. So we, uh, we take boats, you can take seaplanes there. 
but we usually take the boat and once you get there it's just raw wilderness as far as you can see networks of trails um, and a big as you can see moose population here this is a good place to see moose to study moose and to study the predator prey relationship between wolves and moose um, right now i think there's 600 moose on the island and only a couple wolves so what happens is that <laughs> Hopefully they'll get more wolves over there. I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, they used to come over when Lake Superior would freeze, but that's not happening as much anymore. So there's been some talk about bringing more wolves over. I don't know if they have, uh, but they really need to thin out that, um, that moose herd, because the moose are just eating all of the plants. So this is a, it works really well when it's done right. But anyway, this is a good place to see uh, moose. It's on Isle Royale. So we usually camp and backpack while we're here. Uh, we've had other programs uh, do various other things here, but this is what we were doing camping on Lake Superior. And we also go during August when you can forage for berries, which is the only thing you can take from national parks. They always say, uh, leave only footprints, take only photographs, uh, but berries you can take, at least in most of them. So the one thing you can legally take from a park. Kings Canyon, this one is just um, in the Sierras of California. So um, the high country, the Sierra Nevada mountains, waterfalls, a uh, great place to see rattlesnakes. Um, when my mom passed away in 2013, my dad would bring me on, I would bring my dad on trips. He would sign up. I'm like, okay, let's, dad get you, let's get you back out. And one thing I always tell people is to like leave wildlife alone, okay? Um, do not disturb wildlife. And my dad wanted to get the rattlesnake to rattle. So he took his trekking pole and he's like, oh, look at this thing's rattling. I'm like, dad. I had to have one of those moments where I had to be the dad. <laughs> you can't do that, dad. Uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, we need to leave the animals alone. You know, we poke a rattlesnake just to get it to rattle. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we always really encourage our, our students to respect wildlife. So when you do go out there, um, please don't poke the rattlesnakes. So, but you'll see these guys in King's Canyon. Um, but then you have these massive sequoias. Now these are the big trees. These are the biggest things, biggest living um, trees in the world. Okay, now, this is the second biggest one. It's in Kings Canyon at a place called what's it called um, Grant Grove. So this place was actually protected before Kings Canyon. They protected this little grove as a national park. It was the fourth one, but when they took Kings Canyon um, as a park, they kind of included this one as well. So that's something you can see on these massive trees. I, I wish I had somebody next to that tree just to give you some scale, but it's, it's really immense. Um, but why didn't people log these giant sequoias? You know, there's a lot of wood there. We're talking about the pioneers that nearly hunted uh, bison to extinction. The problem with sequoias is when they fall over, they just kind of shatter. So they're not really um, good trees to use for, for building materials. But you can still see the remnants of people that tried in the park. This is Olympic in Washington. This is like three parks in one. You have the, the coast here where you can um, study the intertidal zone, the animals that live between the tides. You can head up into the high country. There's glaciers and mountains up in Olympic and also rainforest. This is the whole uh, rainforest where they get 12 feet of rain a year in this rainforest. That's an old picture. Remember phone booths? Um, actually, the phone booth there grows, uh, grows moss. Uh, Shenandoah, this is in Virginia, uh, very accessible. There's a road that goes through the middle of it called Skyline Drive that you can drive, but it also parallels the Appalachian Trail, which is a 2,000 mile trail that goes from Georgia all the way to Maine. So, you know, pick your poison. Do you want something a little easier where you're looking at the, the leaves change, or do you want to do a backpacking adventure? You can do them both in, uh, in Shenandoah. And this is the Appalachian Trail marker. Some of you have probably been on that trail with me a little bit. We also caught it during a par partial solar eclipse, so we were pretty lucky. Mm -hmm. um, kind of the sister park of um, Shenandoah, I like to call it, is the Great Smoky Mountains. This is the most visited of all of our national parks. You know, most of you guys have probably been here. 14 million people visit uh, the Smokies annually, and rightfully so. It's a very beautiful park. It's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It protects a lot of um, early American houses there are over 80 structures that are still accessible now that you can kind of explore and go inside and kind of learn, learn about early pioneers um, any salamander fans out here this is like the, the salamander what do they call it? the salamander capital of the world of uh, but you will note some of you biologists might say that's not a salamander that's a newt 
And you're correct, you can also see newts. Newts are a little more rough, whereas salamanders are a little more fishy and slight. It's a great place to study um, salamanders and reptiles. Everglades. This is the southern tip of Florida, the largest piece of the wilderness this side of the Mississippi River, also the largest national park on this side of the Mississippi River. Uh, we do kayaking classes here where we camp on beaches. So this is one of your options that are on beaches. Other options are old shell mounds. The Seminole Indians lived here and what they would do, they would collect shells, they would eat, and then they would just kind of create a landfill. What happened to the landfill kind of build after a while where they could actually live on them. So we sometimes camp on those shell mounds. Uh, you can see we're well prepared here. We're in the middle of the uh, Everglades, um, no fresh water, so we always bring our water plenty of food. Or the other option is to spend a night on these chickies, which is good for one night. That's what they're called. They're called chickies. And it's pretty much you're in an area where there's no dry land. There's no beaches. There's none of those shell mounds, but you still need a place to overnight. So the park service made these little elevated platforms where you can unload your gear and, and share an outhouse with your neighbor. So they're really cool for one night, but that's about it. And that's Everglades. Uh, Carlsbad, very beautiful cave in New Mexico. We'll be going here next year. Um, obviously, if you're in, in caves, it's a great place. Interesting structures, uh, but more notable is if you come during the summer season, 500,000 bats live in Carlsbad Caverns National Park. And every evening, people gather in this amphitheater and watch these bats leave. And sometimes it's just a giant cloud. Of just keep on coming as they go out to feed during the night. The only national park that has an internet or a, a domestic airport inside of it is Grand Teton National Park. This is another one that we have the Rockefellers to thank for um, kind of secretly buying up the land, saying they were somebody else and then giving it to the government. So um, this is just uh, south of Yellowstone in Wyoming. Like I said, the only park with an airport inside of it. Excellent photography park, very photogenic. Uh, and this is also a place to study the early Mormon pioneers who built this, uh, this cabin you see right here. And moose. You'll see moose in, uh, in Grand, Grand Teton as well. Bryce Canyon, not so much a canyon as it is kind of a half canyon, but they call it Bryce Canyon. Uh, notable because of the hoodoos, the geological features you see here. Um, different colors of sandstones, different contents, and different minerals which you can see as you kind of hike through the trails there. Uh, what I like to watch is kind of the sun bounce all over the different hoodoos, making this really neat effect. Also one of those wonderful night sky places. I know it's one o'clock, so if you guys have to leave, I'm not offended at all. Um, we're getting near the home stretch here as we get through parks, but um, this kind of reminds you that we're the ones moving, not the stars. So this is a time lapse of, uh, that's called Thor's Hammer in Bryce Canyon National Park in Utah. This is the first park managed by the Park Service. It wasn't a national park, it was a national reserve in Hot Springs, uh, Arkansas. So protected because of the, obviously, this, this natural water that comes out that for, for many years, Native Americans and Europeans would come here to kind of cure ailments. So to the point where they started setting up these bathhouses and you can see kind of those inset slides, some of these medieval things you see in these turn of the century bathhouses where people came to try to get some of their, um, they, they were sick, they didn't know why, but they were, they were pretty much desperate trying anything they could to figure out how to, to, to cure them. So they would come to places like this to try to make them feel better. Um, and still to this day, you can go inside these bathhouses with the same water that's been flowing out of the park for years. It's very, very old water, it's been in the earth uh, much longer than you've been alive. Also trails there. One of our more urban national parks. Zion, we like to do backpacking here. Zion Canyon's very busy, especially the canyon, but if you get up into the high country, you won't see as many folks. This is kind of a, if you think of the Grand Canyon, the very top of the Grand Canyon is the bottom of Zion Canyon. So if the Grand Canyon were to go even higher, this is kind of what it would look like. This is on one of the trails called Angel's Landing where we're using uh, chains to assist ourselves. It does drop a thousand feet on both sides here. So it's, it's nice to have a little bit of a, a chain there to help you. But the views up and down the, the Virgin River Canyon 
uh, are pretty incredible. Again, a lot more narrow than Grand Canyon, but this is a very, very busy park now. So if you want to visit this place, plan ahead. Um, the very end of it is an area called the Narrows, where you can walk up this river into these narrow slot canyons. Eastern Park, this is another one of those Rockefeller parks. Um, Acadia, this is in Maine. Right here we are in Cadillac Mountain. This is the first place to watch the sunrise in the United States. A great multi-sport place. Uh, on the left there we have the um, those carriage roads. There's over 40 miles of carriage roads that they built in Acadia. Because uh, the original plan by the Rockefellers was if we're to develop this land, we don't want any motorized vehicles inside here. Um, that never happened, but they did get their carriage roads, which you can you could travel by bicycle, you can hike, um, and you can also do some sea kayaking here. And you can go lobstering. We went lobstering, and we learned all about that uh, that whole process while we were out there. Because you know, when in Maine, right? Uh, Grand Canyon. We're starting to get near the home stretch here. This is we've been here a number of times. This is my first park with uh, with the College of DuPage. Uh, we used to do backpacking and humanities classes here, where we'd study the, the literature and the architecture of, believe it or not, architecture of um, Grand Canyon. We'd also do some backpacking trips. So this was one where we started on the, the north rim when it was snowing. We were making our way down, and you get to the bottom, and it was 100 and almost 130 degrees <laughs> at the bottom of the canyon. Any of you were on that trip? Maybe some of you. Yeah, um, Grand Canyon, it's, it's equivalent to walking from Canada all the way to Mexico, going from the rim to the river and back, as you can see here by the, the temperature extremes. But you'll also see quite a bit of, you know, you'll see ponderosa pines and you'll see cactus at the bottom. You'll see elk, and when you get to the bottom, you'll see, you know, things like lizards. This guy's a spiny lizard blending in really well. Uh, but what's a good thing to study here? Geology, there's my daughter. <laughs> this is like one of my, like, oh, it brings a tear to my eye. She's like, Dad, look at my Fruit Loops. It looks like the Grand Canyon. <laughs> or it does. And, uh, and I, I wish I would have, I don't say, I don't wish, but it's, it's like I told her to say that. Like, I didn't do this for this picture, but I didn't. She, like, was having her snack, and she saw the limestone's kind of yellowish, and the sandstone's kind of orangish, and, you know, the shale here is a little red, so she kind of put two and two together. So uh, there's on the Grand Canyon. So obviously a great place to study that. They say every foot you step down to the canyon, you just send 10,000 years in geological time. So once you're at the very bottom, you've got rocks that are over a billion years old. Denali. So this is a, this is that one Alaska park that wasn't um, included in the 1980s. Why did we protect Denali? To protect that big mountain? No, for the sheep. Um, there are some hunters in Alaska that really like to hunt sheep and they wanted to make sure that they would always be able to hunt sheep. So they advocated for the protection of doll sheep by this national park, which also includes, as you can see, the highest point in North America, which is now called Denali. Uh, for the longest time it was called Mount McKinley. Uh, recently they changed the name of the mountain, which is very difficult to change to the name of a, a landmark. but. It now has its ancestral name, Athabascan name Denali, meaning the high one. So the Alaska natives that live in this area regarded it as the high one, or Denali. So you can see snowshoe hare here. These are another one of those animals, kind of like porcupine, where you can walk up to. They're, um, they're very confident that they're blended in so well. They'll eventually scatter away, but you'd be surprised how close you get to these guys. And in the summertime, they'll change to kind of a more uh, brownish, but they do have these very big feet, hence the name Snowshoe Hares, which I'm sure is an inspiration for humans that wanted to eventually travel on snow. How are we going to do this? Oh, so, those animals are doing a really good job. Let's just make our feet bigger. And that's how these guys get around. Uh, but the auroras you'll see in the winter. I like to go up there in the summer or in the winter because the auroral oval is right over that part of Alaska. So if you have a clear night, um, there's a good chance for you to see something like this, which you don't see in the summer, obviously because of all of the uh, daylight. 24 hours. You would think you're in Yellowstone, but th no, this is Lassen Volcanic Park. This is in California, 1916, the very old one, uh, protects this uh, very Yellowstone-y, geothermal, sulfury, hot spring area, which you can also access via boardwalks. Just this very colorful, um, smelly area. Uh, but it also has one of the um, Cascade Peaks, the Mount Lassen, so this is a 10,000 mile, or excuse me, 10,000 foot peak that, that we climb off. And so people can add that 
matched to their belt saying they climbed on the Cascade Volcanoes. Speaking of volcanoes, Hawaii volcanoes, uh, we've brought many groups here doing geology for good reason. You can see the earth being made. It's one of those things that shows you we do not live in a, a static time where everything's in place. So you can go down into these calderas, you can see thermals and steam coming out, you can smell it, you can feel it. I think this area is closed now, honestly, because of what's going on there. You can explore lava tubes and learn about that. You can study the ancient Hawaiians. They gave me more pictographs. We've seen a lot of those today. Um, and this is uh, where a road used to be. So Hawaii Volcanoes is very dynamic. It's always changing. So places that you could drive down one day, you can't another day because of these lava flows. Rocky Mountain, when you guys leave today, and if you head south and you see Ogden Avenue, that's Ogden Avenue right there on the left. So next time you go out west, uh, go on that, and it eventually hits becomes Trail Ridge Road in Rocky Mountain National Park, which uh, climbs, I think, about 12,000 feet as it makes its way out west. Um, Aspen time, beautiful, so if you're into trees. Um, it's very yellow, it doesn't have the different colors that we have here or the northeast, but it is just blankets the whole entire park in yellow. It's a very accessible park where you can go into the mountains and if you wanna walk three miles, you can do that. If you, I can go a little bit more, then make the hike for six miles. Oh, I still feel good, go nine miles. So it's a very accessible park for people of all sorts of abilities, um, like many of our other national parks. In the summer, in the afternoons, you're almost always guaranteed a thunderstorm in um, Rocky Mountain National Park. So if you wanna chase rainbows, that's a great place to do that as well. Uh, very predictable weather, so honestly a good place to study weather as well. Glacier. This is in Montana near the border of Canada. Uh, protected not so much because of glaciers, but to, as kind of a classroom for what glaciers can do. So if you look at all of those U-shaped valleys and that turquoise lakes, those are all results of glaciers covering this area. But you can still hike to some. That's a very small one you can see up there. Uh, you can see a little crevasse above it. So there are still a few active glaciers you can hike to in Glacier, uh, but I would go while you still can. See mountain goats there? And you'll also see grizzly bears. Now this is a grizzly, this isn't a brown bear. Um, these are grizzly bears, about 600 pounds, and these are found more so in the interior. And outside of Alaska, um, this part of Montana and Yellowstone National Park are the only other places you're gonna be able to see grizzly bears. Mesa Verde, this is one that Theodore Roosevelt protected. Obviously, this is something that was protected to preserve the works of man. Very different than other national parks at the time, which were protected for aesthetic beauty, but Roosevelt thought this one was deserving of being protected for other reasons. So you could see these ancestral Puebloan cliff dwellings um, from afar, and you can also go inside of them. So you can go down inside of these kivas and kind of live like an ancestral Pueblo did years ago. Wind Cave, this is our very first national park. This is in South Dakota. There is the opening, and then the ranger right there is showing you why it's called Wind Cave. Uh, Native Americans discovered it. They found a hole with wind coming out of it, called it Wind Cave. But further exploration reveals this uh, very unique feature called boxwork. So um, as far as caves go, this is a very, very rare a phenomenon that you can see only in Wind Cave and a few other places. This is a place called the Mail Room. Uh, but above ground, there's a lot to offer as well. All those little specks you see are those bison. So another place we have um, that protects bison from, from hunting. And pronghorn, you'll see these guys too, up in the Great Plains. Crater Lake, this is another remnant of a Cascade volcano. We talked about Lassen Volcano. This is one that kind of collapsed on itself and filled with water. This is the deepest lake in North America. It's also the clearest. Uh, you can access the lake via a boat. And once they're out there, they'll throw this disc down that goes 200 feet down and you can still see it. So it's the, not only the deepest, but also the, um, the, one of the clearest in North America. Also August, wildflowers. Right, Ken? <laughs> Another Cascade Volcano. This is Mount Rainier National Park by Seattle. This is the highest, 14,000 feet. A great glacier uh, classroom. Wonderful hiking. Um, you can see the weather on here. This is a lenticular cloud that forms on these high peaks at times. 
or it may be very quiet where I am down here. Um, it's much windier and chaotic up there. I climbed this years ago, and this happened the night before we climbed, so we couldn't climb it, but we eventually got to the top. And once we did, we realized that indeed it is a volcano. So the photographer right here is on the one lip of the volcano, and you can see it encircling uh, me and my climbing partner over there. So it is a dormant volcano, albeit still an active one. If you're familiar with Mount St. Helens, um, not too far from here. Same deal, same chain of mountains. Yosemite. Uh, this was doing the John Muir Trail uh, quite a few years ago, which goes uh, all across the park, linking Yosemite Valley all, all the way to Mount Whitney, which is in Sequoia National Park, which is the highest point in the continental United States. So we, we did some backpacking here. Uh, that is Cathedral Peak in the background, first climbed by John Muir, who was one of the pioneers of protecting um, a lot of our national parks, including Yosemite. So we backpack here, and I love backpacking because you only bring the very, very essentials. So this is everything I have with me for however many days we were on that trail, but it's really liberating with our society when we rely on so many things to go backpacking and really have a streamlined kit where uh, that's really all I had for the whole duration. Uh, very nice, I love it. Here's the group. So these are the College of DuPage students. <laughs> Um, this is our community members. We get all different types of people from backgrounds, ages. Um, this was the group I had for this year um, doing the, the John Muir Trail. We had another group as well. So this, I had half of them. We tend to travel in small groups when we're in wilderness areas. But it's, what's notable about this is that we were just in this really wild area where we really didn't see a lot of people. And now it was culture shock because we were returning to Yosemite Valley. You can see the people down there. And you see just people with coolers and, and folding chairs heading up this trail. It's like, oh, I guess we're back, guys. <laughs> so that was a little rough. <clears throat> Yosemite is also notable for Ansel Adams photography. And this, this isn't one of his. I just took one of mine of Half Dome and put a black and white filter on. But if you think of um, artists, so many were inspired by our national parks. Sequoia, this is, again, those really, really, really big trees. All right, the big massive ones. And while th although this isn't the best one, it shows you how resilient sequoias are to fires. There's a lot of fires out in California, especially more recently, but these plants are actually designed with a very wet, spongy bark to, to, to weather fires okay. And actually, the sequoia will not grow unless there's a fire because it, it kind of forces the cone to open and the seeds to come up. So you need fires in order for these massive trees to grow. And it's incredible how tiny the seed is, nearly microscopic, and how it, once again, after 2,000 years, forms the, the largest living things on Earth. So this is the big guy. I don't know who measured it, but apparently um, the General Sherman tree in Sequoia National Park is the largest tree, or some say the largest living thing in the world. And you can also see domes, just like Yosemite. Again, it's the Sierra, it's the same type of topography. Last one, guys, Yellowstone. This is our very first national park. This was the model that all of our parks were founded upon. A lot of parks in other countries um, use Yellowstone as a model because this was the first one. This was the great idea um, used to, uh, to protect this area of incredible wildlife and obviously just very surreal geology. Um, this thing goes off about every 600,000 years. Two million years ago when it went off, it covered, I believe, Iowa in seven feet of ash. You're talking about something, um, I think, 300 times what Mount St. Helen was. Uh, 500 square miles of debris was launched into the sky last, thing, last time this thing went off. And then it went off again in uh, 1.2 million years ago, and last time 600,000 years ago, which makes you wonder, is it due? So there's a lot of stuff going on under the ground here. Uh, the one on the left is Old Faithful, which is a geyser that goes off with fairly regularity about every hour or so. And this was in the foreground as Castle Geyser. So we were fortunate to catch them both go off at the same time. Also has these hot springs. So this is the Grand Prismatic Spring. Gets its name because obviously the very interesting colors. The very middle, it's deep and clear, so it's going to be bluer near the corners where it lightens up a little bit. It's shallower, so the water's not as blue. Uh, but the bacteria grow at, become different colors depending on the temperature of the bacteria. So obviously the stuff that's very hot is that yellow stuff where the cooler bacteria is red. 
And so if you want to see this, you go in the summertime because otherwise it's just a big giant steam bath and you can't see much. Uh, so we do go here in the winter as well. So this is how you get around Yellowstone in the summer, um, but both times you do have bison problems where they, they give you some, some issues getting from place to place. And waterfalls. Yeah, this Yellowstone gets its name from the left, as you can see there, the, the yellow color of the, the rocks as it cuts, the, as the Yellowstone River um, cuts through the area. It looks very different in the winter, as you can see right there. I think that's my last one. All right, any questions on national parks? I know I, I left a few out. Um, I noticed Capitol Reef's not in there. Anybody catch that? That's kind of that fifth park in Utah that's really great, but a lot of people don't go there because the other four parks are much more notable. Um, there's two Arctic parks in Alaska I left out. Um, one called Gates of the Arctic, one called Kobu Valley. Coincidentally, we're doing a class there this summer. And then I also left out um, the National Park of American Samoa, which we'll be visiting next year. So that's the one we have not been to, which is a very, um, it's near the International Dateline, south of the equator, closer to New Zealand than Hawaii. Um, and in addition to the interesting scenery, the tropical features, um, bats to explore there, coral reefs, and as well, in addition to the Samoan culture, we'll explore there. All right, that's it. Thanks for coming, everybody. Oh, uh, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our staff. We have Marn McKellen back there, uh, Sue Kirby, and we have Lynn. You guys all know Lynn? Anybody that wants to meet Lynn? She'll be signing autographs afterward. Uh, Lynn is pretty much the person that keeps our office going. So a lot of you don't know her by, only, no, only know her voice, but there she is, live and in person. So um, I'm sure Lynn knows a lot of you guys. So, but thanks for coming.